to call the uh, January 2019 uh, meeting of the Sacramento Environmental Commission to order. Jill, can you read the roll call, please? Mark Berry. Dr. Anthony DeRigi. Here. Richard Hun. Here. Diane Kinderman. George Buzz Link. Here. Margie Namba. Here. Laura Nickerson. Here. Eric Rivero Montez. Here. Mark White. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, just to, uh, for the audience benefit, I'd like to do a quick introduction of commissioners, starting you with you, Tony, at your end of the diocese. Yeah, I'm Tony DeRigi. I'm a retired pediatrician from Kaiser Permanente and uh, with an interest in environmental health. I'm Mark White. We, <coughs> excuse me. Just learning to talk. We had a um, consulting firm that worked for garbage companies in cities and counties on recycling and solid waste permitting issues. Eric Rivera Montes. I'm the representative for the city of Elk Grove. I work for the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, SMUD, in their environmental uh, services group focusing on climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. I'm Richard Hun, a uh, consulting and environmental planner, and I'm uh, representing Sacramento County. Marie Wooden, Director for Environmental Management Department, staff to the commission. I'm Buzz Link, I'm a uh, Sacramento County appointee. I'm a registered civil engineer with uh, my primary interest is in uh, water. Good, good evening, my name is Margie Namba, and I work for Granite Construction. I'm a representative of the County of Sacramento. That's it. Good evening, my name is Laura Nickerson. I was born and raised here in Sacramento. I'm still a full-time registered nurse, and my specialty is rehabbing wildlife and releasing them back into the wild. Thank you, everybody. Um, this is an opportunity for uh, receiving any public comment. If there's anybody in the audience who would like to make a, any statement to the commission, this is a time to do so. Uh, seeing none, uh, we're going to move on to our first speaker tonight, Mr. Doug Osborne, an environmental specialist, uh, who's going to be discussing the Environmental Management Department uh, Mutual Aid Assistance to Butte County. Doug, go ahead. Metro Cable, can you pull up the first presentation? Good evening, board members. My name is Doug Osborne. I'm with the, an environmental specialist with the Environmental Management Department. Uh, my colleague Jan Bradshaw and I uh, responded to the mutual aid request for Butte County in response to the devastating uh, wildfire that went through and destroyed the town of Paradise. Um, I wanted to start out by showing you kind of where we reported to. And let's see. So our first stop was the OE Cal OES base camp. Uh, Cal OES, the Office of Emergency Services, put up a base camp to better get resources into and out of the, uh, the, the area. Um, you can see on the photos there, that was the sign that greeted us every night. And uh, up in the other photos were uh, some staging for the California National Guard. The um, Conservation Corps was also there, um, and all the other responders that were, were asked to come in and help also stayed at the Cal OES base camp. These were our humble accommodations. We had tents that we stayed in, about 12 people uh, to a tent. Um, we had portable showers, and uh, we had a very large mess hall. So every night and every morning, we'd have breakfast and dinner there. Um, lunches were brown bagged, and we hit the field um, with our brown bag lunch. Here's some of our camp smiles the first day we arrived. Uh, one of our first assignments was to work at the FEMA Assistance Center. This was an area uh, or a, a facility put up by FEMA and the state. Um, it really had every agency under the sun you might need in one place to help start rebuilding your, your lives or your life with uh, anything from identification to small business assistance loans from the SBA, um, any other government resource that you might need to 
help put the pieces back to what was missing when when you left your your home uh, with the, with the clothes on your back. Um, uh, insurance was a big part of it too. That uh, was a State Farm was there in the parking lot of the assistance center. This was at the Chico Mall, so it was a very familiar place, a big landmark that everybody, a lot of people knew of. Another one of our assignments um, was reporting to um, checkpoints. So the National Guard has a pre had a presence when the roads were closed and the areas were not open to the public yet. Behind that Humvee was a highway patrol as well. But we were there to help the residents that were given access to the area prior to the public getting access. We provided some personal protective equipment so they could be safe if they did decide to go in and, and look through their property or go into the ash footprint of their homes. The other photos there was kind of the next phase of our um, deployment. Um, it was a training day and where we were going to go out to actually start re uh, overseeing or, or working with the folks that were removing the, de the debris or the household hazardous waste. Uh, NRC was a, a contractor with a pretty large presence there. Uh, myself, Jan, and the other two folks that went were kind of assigned to one of those uh, contracting crews, and we were given a, an area to go start cleaning or, or removing the household hazardous waste. So things like uh, those propane containers that are marked in the, in the photo that you see, uh, the hazard was removed because the propane was consumed in the fire, but that needed to be determined before the next phase could take place. So they were marked with a big white X to denote that this is safe to remove. It's only uh, scrap metal at this point. Another one of our tasks was to mark each property with some health um, information, and that's what I was doing there in that photo. So um, another truck up there is a arborist. So one of the biggest hazards up there was uh, trees and dangerous hazard trees. Um, you can see in this one photo, beyond all that aluminum, that melted aluminum, um, are two X's. I don't know if I have a pointer here. Oh. Two, kind of off in the distance there, you can see two uh, white X's on those trees. Those were hazard trees, meaning that they could fall at any moment. So we were uh, uh, told in the safety breeding briefing, do not go near those trees, stay away, don't meet near them. Um, the other photo of the tree with the two vertical lines denoted a not so hazardous tree. Still don't want to go near it or hang out by it, but um, it's not, it, it is a dangerous tree. The roots have been compromised. One thing we noticed too is in the driveways of most of the residents was this, uh, <clears throat> this, this X pattern. And what we found out was that was the search and rescue's uh, first um, assessment. Search and rescue came in and made a determination as to the hazards on the property. So the top numbers that you see, the top of the X is uh, the date, and then the division that was in there, so division D3, and then the hazard was over to the right, and it just says carport. I don't have a picture of the carport, but it was leaning and you know, it was a hazard if you were to go underneath it. And then the zero at the bottom meant that there was no fatalities at that residence. Another hazard was um, septic tanks. 95% of Par the town of Paradise is on septic systems. So uh, it turns out this one contractor was walking through carrying, moving into the, uh, to do his job and this was lightly covered with soil, so you could not see um, the hazard underneath. And since the lid was compromised, it was a fiberglass lid compromised by the fire. Uh, when he stepped onto it, he sank into his waist. But fortunately, he arrested his fall with his arms, and um, they were able to decon him on site, give him some new coveralls, and, and he got back to, back to work after that. That uh, created a huge awareness for um, all the other responders that were there, and that was a big safety briefing at the next, next morning. A couple other hazards was uh, the, the photo on your left is a tree root, or a tree that had been burned completely, and all you see there is the, the holes in the ground left by the roots. 
Um, and those were fairly common. Another commonality was the, um, our common site was these other holes, which were drainage culverts. Most of the drainage culverts up there were plastic, so when they were exposed to the heat, they either caught fire or melted. And uh, that's going to be one of the huge infrastructure recoveries um, that's going to have to take place or is already taking place now, um, re replacing all those culverts. Um, I have a couple photos here of a, a trailer park where we um, spend a lot of our time um, removing all the household hazardous waste. Um, you can see the sign and the directory were, were left intact. Um, the, the directory came in very handy, as you can see from the next photo, with all the displaced mailboxes, we really had no way to identify any of those properties. So we went back to that um, directory, took a photo of it, and we were able to identify um, every property we were on once they were cleaned and get them documented properly. Um, you kind of had to uh, be a sleuth out there trying to find uh, the correct addresses when you're out there in the field. Um, there's not a lot of landmarks anymore, of course. This fire was very, very devastating, as you all have heard and probably have all have seen. Um, this is a one property, um, and you can just see the devastation was complete. Um, this person had been living here uh, the greater part of his life, collected numerous vehicles and stuff. It was a fairly large parcel. Um, and he had a lot of, he was a car collector, so he had a lot of classic cars. Um, this, he was devastated by this fire, and um, he, he's going to have a, a long time before his property is cleaned up, as you can see. Um, and the devastation was complete. And it was not limited to residential fires, uh, or residential property. Commercial property was also damaged. and. I have a picture of a couple gas stations there. Um, the canopies were not part of, uh, did, did not get consumed in the fire, but the convenience stores where all the uh, electronics that run the pumps are. So there's no fuel up in the town of Paradise um, at this time. You have to bring it in, you know, come in with a full tank from Oroville or Chico and um, hope you don't need fuel while you're there. Uh, but yeah, businesses uh, were just completely devastated and gone. Um, that seemed like a stark contrast from the other fires we've had. Um, I didn't go up to the Reading fire, but the fire in Sonoma um, was primarily residential. Um, only a few, well, there was commercial structures, but not as, not as dense or not as impacted as the fire in Paradise. Um, and there is a case to be made for defensible space. Um, that just is across the street from that trailer park. Um, the trailer park had 100 units, and only one of them survived, and you can see it down there in the bottom right. Um, it didn't have any defensible space in that trailer, um, but yet somehow it was spared. So it really came down to the behavior of the fire at the time it was burning, whether or not your property survived. In this photo here I put in, just to kind of give you an idea of the vastness um, of the fire, you can kind of see off in the distance the ridge. Um, imagine uh, flames 100 to 200 feet higher than the ridge and coming towards you and in a way uh, that a wave would crash on the beach, the, the, the fire was, oops, was le lapping over the tops of those mountains. Um, and then combined with you know 55 mile an hour winds, that fire was moving fast, and it really just overtook the entire town so fast. And in the meantime, the embers are being thrown a mile or two ahead of the fire, um, starting spot fires in the town. So there was literally fire all around when these people were trying to escape, and they literally did escape with their lives, the ones that did get out. And I'll turn it over to my colleague Jan. Thank you very much. Uh, Marie, members of the commission, thank you for having Doug and I here to tell you about our experience in Butte County. Um, I tend to talk a lot, which is one of the reasons I think they selected us to be community liaisons in Butte County. Uh, 
um, basically communicating with local residents rather than having EPA uh, officials or their contractors communicate with residents. We basically, we talk all day long, and so I'm hoping that I won't give you a thousand words here. I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. Um, but I tried to um, tailor this part of our presentation to uh, to show you a little bit about the, the um, nuts and bolts of what we did when we were at the office. And so the first week um, that we were there, we were working with uh, representatives from the California Association of Environmental Health Administration, CAHA. And so that's a 503C nonprofit that contracts through CCDEH to coordinate mutual aid workers uh, at these incidents. And so Doug and I, as well as uh, countless other people, worked in Sonoma County last year uh, working with these people. And so the first week we were working with Diana Cato and Ken Stewart uh, at the Butte County Environmental Health Office. And so um, we had to, um, had to learn and teach each other about a few different administrative functions that are, are different than our normal daily tasks. Um, one of the things that came up was our ability to complete um, an ICS 214 form that's required by FEMA to, to be reimbursed at the end of a project. And um, it, it came up as, as a, an issue because it's quite detailed. And so we had to work together as teams to understand really what FEMA required in the ICS 214 form so we could deliver those to the CAHA representatives so they'd have their files complete as each mutual aid responder came on after us because we were the first group uh, to go to Butte County. So we were trying to help them so they weren't experiencing the same problems Sonoma County experienced later on. Uh, when they had people looking at the 214 forms to see if they were valid forms. And so some administrative duties uh, were burdensome the first week. Um, working with the Butte County um, Environmental Health staff, um, uh, we were working, uh, I guess, uh, we were working with Doug Dance, who is the interim director in Butte County, as well as with Tom Parker. Um, and so then uh, we understood some of their needs there. Uh, their needs really revolved around their ability to, um, to collect data uh, because uh, the phase one of this cleanup was, uh, was um, run by US EPA and their contractors. And so they used their own uh, database or their own um, applications to gather information in the field. Um, and so the environmental health staff um, in Sonoma County that we worked with, uh, they had already developed um, tools that we could use in the field to gather data um, uh, ahead, uh, ahead of our, our arrival. So we arrived during phase two, which was debris removal. Uh, in the Butte County case, though, we arrived at the beginning of phase one, which was household hazardous waste cleanup. And like I said, it was uh, run by US EPA and their contractors. And so they had um, control of the applications and the tools that were used to collect electronic data in the field. So the first week we were trying to help Tom figure out how to basically get basic information. What APNs were serviced? What were the addresses that were serviced? Were there any well or septic issues at each property? Could we collect contact information for people or tenants at the properties, either the owners or the, the tenants we might run across at the property? So these were things that Tom communicated to us that he really wanted. And so if you see to the upper right in this slide, um, there's a simple form that we developed uh, during the first week while we were working in the office um, that we thought would be fairly rudimentary to implement. Um, and so then Tom uh, edited that a little bit, uh, revised it to suit his needs, and that was the initial paper form that we used as mutual aid uh, responders uh, to collect data e at each site. Um, again, because the electronic data collection tools were in, uh, in the control of the EPA and their contractors. Um, and so then in working with uh, uh, Diana and Ken at the office, we helped to develop other ideas on how to share information. Um, we started um, working with um, a whiteboard with phone numbers and who, who, uh, who's from, uh, who reported to which county and things like that um, so that we could share that information. Um, I'm sorry, during the first week we also had an opportunity to meet. Um, we had a meeting at the US EPA uh, office and we met with Tom Dunkelman, who's the on-site coordinator, on-scene coordinator for the EPA. And he provided us with information about how 
the cleanup progress would begin and how it would scale up over time. And so we were there to watch the beginning uh, with maybe six to nine teams in the first week uh, collecting household haz hazardous waste. They scaled up to something like 25 teams over the next few weeks um, and they used an area near the United Rentals Yard in Chico as a staging area and it was very impressive to, to watch how they, how they um, used the area. It was a, a vacant lot to start with but the, over the course of two weeks they were able to pave the lot and bring in mobile trailers and turn it into a true consolidation zone. It, it was almost like a transfer storage and disposal facility by the time they were complete. Um, on week two, we got out of the office. So week one was mostly office time. When we had free time, we would help to fill bags that contained Tyvex, gloves. Um, later, they were able to get some foot protection, uh, hazard advisory, and an N95 mask um, at, because uh, there were pallets of donations that they needed to bag up so that individual constituents could have PPE as they went to their properties. Uh, in that task, we were working alongside with Conservation Corps um, people, uh, and so it didn't matter what a person's skill level was at that point or what somebody could bring to the table, it's what was needed at the time. And so we were basically working as a group to just fill bags. Um, week two, uh, the first day of week two was the first day of phase one household hazardous uh, waste removal. And uh, so uh, I think uh, Doug showed you a slide of uh, the four of us standing there with the uh, contractors, the EPA contractors in the same scenes. Um, we found ourselves kind of um, observing the training that was occurring because the EPA training was focused on safety and the logistics of remo removing household hazardous waste. The teams they put together did the actual work. And so we were faced with what do we do as mutual aid workers in addition to the, um, the occasional um, resident or constituent that we might run across to communicate with. And so we, we realized that we, we would provide a second set of eyes to the teams that were on the ground. And we also realized that while they were focused on the, the physical aspect of removing waste, um, they weren't really paying attention to signage or posting at the properties. And so um, after communicating with Tom the first week and understanding one of his main concerns was whether they would need to backtrack into areas with code enforcement or someone else to understand which properties had been serviced, I understood how important signage was to the local agency because if it wasn't posted properly, it wouldn't be clear at the parcel that it was serviced and we'd have to find that electronic database and if we don't have that information, we wouldn't know. So really what the county had was a physical form that we were completing at each site and the fact that each site was posted correctly. So this is actually a picture of the very first post being driven at the very first parcel that was cleared. Um, that day, the EPA still had signs left from another incident. It appeared to be hur hurricane signs because they had grommets in the signs, so they had been screwing them to the front of buildings. Here, we were using staplers to staple the signs to the poles, and so they had a supply of signs that were from a previous incident um, or uh, possibly a hurricane, uh, and the signs weren't present the first day. So we were, uh, we were told that uh, to differentiate one wooden post from another wooden post, we were going to designate any wooden posts that were representative of a phase one cleanup with white paint. Uh, and so then that evolved uh, to uh, painting the post white and then uh, writing on the post EPA DTSC. So we were clear that that post was a post that was representative of a phase one cleanup. Um, the other concept was how would we know that that post was driven at that property versus a post that was intended for another property. Someone could move it. And so then we did try to start writing addresses on the posts where we could. And these seem like trivial details, but when we get down to the ground level uh, at, at, the, at each parcel, uh, it could be raining, the post could fall, uh, somebody could decide to move it. So it was important to post each property. Um, and so then over the weekend, between the first week and the second week, after realizing that the local agency did need some forms of, of data collection, I 
took it upon myself and I was thinking about how to do that in a simple way so that we could document each parcel. So I bought a few different whiteboards at Walmart uh, and provided those to the first teams. I started working on a concept that the local agency was, was okay with if it worked. And I wasn't trying to, to change anything or force more details, trying to find some simple way to bring the data back to the local agency. And so my thought was to complete a whiteboard that had the APN number and the address and maybe a notation about asbestos if I could, if there was any asbestos remaining at the property. Um, that concept, I started to implement that the first week and during the first two days, I had the opportunity to meet um, uh, the UXO contractor who's assigned to the site. And uh, so his name is William Bridges. And uh, he, had, he explained to me that he had experience worldwide whiteboarding different locations. UXO contractor means the unexploded ordnance contractor that was assigned to this mission for the EPA. And so he has experience working in different war zones, removing munitions. And the reason that he was on this project was because they, they, they anticipated that they would find munitions that were larger than 50 caliber or other dangerous munitions in the field. Um, Will was telling me that um, he had uh, been on the Aleutian Islands working for some time the week before he came uh, to Butte County in that capacity and that he'd worked all over the world working with whiteboards trying to identify locations so that he could simply take a picture and then forward that information to the agency that they could capture the information in the field and forward it on in picture form. And so he had developed an application that allowed for electronic whiteboarding uh, in a simple application on a tool, whether it's an iPad or a tablet or a cell phone. And so then after realizing uh, how burdensome the, the physical whiteboards were to everyone else, I collected those uh, because nobody was really using those. And uh, now I think they're going to be uh, stocking stuffers next year. That's my plan anyway. Um, but I had the opportunity to introduce Will to Tom. And uh, unfortunately, it was a little bit late in, in this uh, phase one. And so then I don't know if Tom was able to integrate with the US EPA to, to mine their data not yet or not. We'll, we'll learn about that later on. Um, but another aspect of phase two and working in the field, this, this video is sideways, so I apologize for that. Um, but it, it had to do with our ability to communicate with people and also our ability as mutual aid responders working in, in public here in the county daily uh, to recognize different situations that we come across. And so some of those situations were really obvious. Uh, in this picture, the yellow sign uh, says, uh, here to loot, we will shoot. And it's a, a laser etched aluminum sign. So someone really knows how to use their tools and you have to take something like that seriously. Uh, it's very apparent, that situational awareness, it's apparent. Um, the windmill on the right wasn't necessarily apparent. The professional people on the cleanup crew that I was assigned to, they knew what they were seeing when they came up on that windmill that was still running. Um, I didn't think about it at first, and then I started paying attention. The, the turbine's still running, it's still generating electricity, the power line is on the ground, and then they're removing household hazardous waste from near the turbine. Um, the here to loot, loot, we will shoot sign was pretty apparent. Another sign that had a, a much stronger um, uh, message that we saw, and I didn't get a picture of it, was we have a backhoe and guns, keep out. So we definitely had to pay attention to who we were talking to, what was their state of mind uh, at each step. And then I came upon this area that was across from the Paradise Airport, along with several other people. Um, what I have to say about this picture, though, is in the upper right, the open pit that has filter fabric on, that was nowhere near the Paradise Airport. And that area um, I, I put in this presentation just because as I work with the contractors from other states, I realized that they may not recognize or know anything about the agriculture in our community or the dangers that it might present. And so we did work on different parcels that had some legal issues possibly uh, that we needed to be aware of. That's the picture in the upper right. The lower left picture, that's uh, obviously not human. It's a pile of, of deer bones. Um, but the picture in the upper left, uh, that scene, uh, I looked at it and I, I w it's remarkable. The pickup truck embedded the, the brick 
pillar and the iron fence into the rear end of that car. Um, and so the collision was extremely forceful and during that accident, um, which the, the truck could only have been coming down from the Chico or from the Paradise Airport at that point, and the car could only have been parked against the fence on the other side. The force of the collision was so great that the brick piers were thrown over the embankment. And so the, the sign that we saw earlier, here to loot, we will shoot, was on the road down into Hidden Valley, just beyond that car. Um, and then the pillars were thrown over the hill. As I looked down at the pillars, I saw all these cans. And so we were looking for household hazardous waste. When I got near the cans in the lower right picture, there was a, a burn vertebrae. And so I sent that over to Butte County Sheriff's Department. And from the image, they could tell it wasn't human origin. But I, I couldn't understand how a vertebrae could get into that location. And I still don't understand it. Um, but the, the image of the truck and the car give me uh, pause and uh, that it's just such a violent still shot and representative of probably someone trying to escape. Um, my role as community liaison at that location down the hill got quite buried and really very diverse uh, the next day. Um, I was working with several EPA representatives and one of the representatives was qualifying different properties to understand if the EPA PIO and a San Francisco Chronicle photographer could gain access to one of the properties. And so these images, I captured those from the San Francisco Chronicle. And this is the team that I was working with. And so on this one lane gravel road going down into Hidden Valley, I found myself with about eight vehicles that were representative of the phase one cleanup operation. Um, and so I'm there to communicate with the residents. The EPA is doing a very good job of doing that as well, especially with the PIO present. And there I am with eight vehicles and everyone wants to be on that scene and involved in that story. Uh, then a wide load came down the road. The owner had a shed being delivered. Uh, so it was a chase vehicle, a tractor and a trailer and they were trying to get that shed onto the property that was currently being cleared. Then a solar provider was coming down the road to try to extinguish a solar fire at the bottom of the valley. So my, my role as community liaison at that point became a valet. I began moving cars for people, telling people how to navigate on one lane dirt roads. And so really putting on different hats and recognizing where we can provide the, the most uh, benefit while we're in the field, I, I saw is very important. Um, but what I really wanna leave you with here is that um, several of us worked uh, with Sonoma County uh, last year uh, during their fires. Many people worked in Sonoma County and in Butte County. Um, and uh, there in Sonoma County, we were tasked with data collection using ArcGIS. Um, and so we were loaded with an ArcGIS application on our phones and our tablets. Um, and we also used an uh, explorer for ArcGIS. Um, as I understand the applications, the explorer for ArcGIS does not allow the user to edit or enter any information that's in the system, uh, where a fully functional ArcGIS application would allow a person to enter data and to edit data that's on the system. Um, um, so to the commission, I have to say that the data collection tools, iPads, tablets, or smartphones, and applications, whether it's ArcGIS, Explorer for ArcGIS, QGIS, Google Maps API, or any other applications, they might be more difficult uh, to implement in Sacramento County if we need them. Uh, if they're not developed before we have an event here. And I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not party to whether uh, we have already prepared for those things. I, I just witnessed um, that Sonoma County had been prepared at the time we arrived and we were using those tools to try to benefit them. And then in Butte County, we were trying to help them develop any other tool that could help them develop a database. Do you have any questions? Thank you, thank you, Jan. Thank you, Doug. That was a great presentation. Lots of detail, very insightful. Uh, is there any commissions uh, questions from the commission, Mark? You guys did a heck of a job. You keep talking about the data collection and using paper and taking pictures of whiteboards. Didn't EPA share their tools with you? Um, 
to, uh, as a mutual aid responder, I was not involved in uh, any of the coordination of those activities, and I don't know to this. It just time. seems like we all paid for them. Um, and it, it would have been a better thing for you to use those and be able to feed directly. And I know FEMA is, its second name is details, especially details you forgot to put in. I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I would imagine that they would over time, and I would imagine that at the beginning stages of phase one, it would be difficult to share those tools because they wouldn't want to compromise their, their information. We don't have phase one yet for the next one, though. I, I I'm, I'm wondering if, if the county has a, like a strike force thing they're putting together for the next one of these, because I bet you my annual salary this is not the last, which I don't make much, though. I learned this evening that they should complete phase one by February 1st, and so maybe we can learn more about that after. I'm just thinking going forward, because you guys get called on. <laughs> Frankly, because the department has the expertise, you guys are really good at what you do, and you get up there and do it. And if we had a, you know, a, a plan for the next strike, for somehow to integrate the data thing, because that seems like, to me, from what you've said, a big linchpin. Just wonder. Oh, and where does the household hazardous waste end up? Where does it go? Uh, so phase one, they took it back to the uh, EPA um, staging, area. The staging yeah. area, and then it was taken off to a class two landfill or further processed um, and manifested and um, properly disposed from there. So it kind of came out of the whole fire burn area to a central location where it was further assessed and then um, manifested out of there to the proper disposal. So appropriate materials went to class two and appropriate ones went to class one? Correct. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions, Marjorie? I have a couple of questions. Um, in slide number nine, it says doing the job phase one field work. You weren't required to use gloves or a mask to put up the signs? Um, we were well outside of the burn area. We were advised to stay 50 feet from the hot zone, which would be the debris field. And so then where we were with the signs, we didn't recognize any hazards. And then um, when you're putting up the signage, it looks like some of the signage was paper. Wasn't there like a rain event that happened? Did they, anything happen to those signs? That they did provide waterproof uh, paper, so it was like a mylar print. Oh, okay. The other thing is, I have a question. What is a solar fire? A solar fire is a fire that occurs because the solar system is generating and there's nothing to take the energy. And so it's uh, solar energy that's uh, generated into electricity and it's on fire. Thank you. Any other questions? I've got a couple. Um, so how many EMD staff were actually up there? I, I counted four from the pictures, uh, Doug. Four was the initial. Um, deployment and then on a two-week rotational basis we've been the department's been sending two additional um, employees and how long has that been going on or is it still going on it's still going on we have two people in the field right now okay and we were there the first week after uh, Thanksgiving okay and I saw one photo or uh, there was a roster of names from different counties and I counted that San Mateo had a, a large presence there yep as well as Placer County had a, a, a smaller presence. Did any other counties participate or that you're aware of? Uh, Contra Costa County was there. Um, do you recall uh, not, at, not at the time that we were there. Yeah. I, I don't know who's there now. So, so in your initial phase work up there, how many parcels did you end up assessing? Do you have any idea? There was 100 at that uh, trailer park, so that was over three days that the crews that I was working with took care of those. Um, and then there was probably eight, depending on the size of the parcel, but anywhere from maybe 10 to 20 a day were being hit by one crew. Okay. Times that times nine crews on average. Okay, and then now in the, in the current work, you're going back and doing other detailed studies of those same parcels, then I guess. Uh, th what that did was clear the way for phase two, yeah. which would be the separation of the ash footprint, the concrete, and the uh, and the metals. Okay. Um, and I, this is a question that follows on Mark's comment. Uh, is there any opportunity to put together a lessons learned document or a report that you could? 
applied to EMD executives or us that kind of says, you know, the things we saw here that we would not want to repeat again next time there's an emergency. Uh, and is, is that something that you guys have in the back of your mind or anything like that? We do, and I think at the when we're when our deployment is finished, we'll get together and do a hot wash or a round table of uh, things that worked well, the things that we that didn't work well. Um, I think that might be more of an internal process just through the department, um, but I'm sure you could work with our our management to you know um, get some kind of feedback on what the pros and cons were. Yeah, I think that would be valuable. Uh, it seems like not everything went smoothly, but for the for the because of the situation, it went well enough, yeah. Okay. Definitely a, a fly by the seat of your pants many times when you get out there um, filling, filling whatever role needs to be filled um, when, that, when that call comes up. Well, we really appreciate your efforts on this, and uh, thank you very much for the presentation tonight. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. I want to say thank you, Doug and Jan, my staff, for coming out here. Um, you guys did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, our next agenda item is um, Rick Johnson, Executive Director from the Sacramento Area Flood Control Agency. Rick's uh, made presentation to us on several occasions. It's good to see you again. And you're going to give us an update for January 2019. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for letting me come here. And um, we had a very um, eventful year last year, so it's a good opportunity to, to uh, update update you on this. So I just wanted to start out just a, a little reminder what protects Sacramento from flooding. We've got about 106 miles of levees and a few channels down at the uh, um, South Sacramento Streams Group down there. Folsom Dam up on the American River, um, Yellow Bypass over on the west of us and then the Sacramento Bypass uh, connecting over to the Yellow Bypass. So this is our basic system. This is what protects us. So we've got six authorized projects, federally authorized projects that address all the components of our system. The, the three white ones there, we're, we have just completed. We're in the closeout stages on those. Uh, two, of, two of the other ones, construction has been initiated. And on the, the final one there, we hope to initiate uh, that this year. So why do we need to do all this work? We are still, unfortunately, the number one most at-risk um, community in the country for rivering flooding. Um, for a while after, after Katrina hit, um, New Orleans was number one, but the Corps of Engineers, they've put about $20 billion into rebuilding the system, and they've surpassed us back again about a year or so ago. So, so unfortunately, we're, we're number one again. You know, we're, we're sitting right at the confluence of two cities, uh, or, I'm sorry, two major rivers with the city at or just above uh, sea level, and um, great place to live, just a lousy spot from flood control standpoint. There are about a half million people in the deep flood plains and over $70 billion worth of property damage. So I, I still, most parts of Sacramento don't quite have a 100-year level protection. Unfortunately, because of the way we sit, some parts like Natomas are completely surrounded by levees. Others can flood from either creeks, Sacramento River, or American River. So until we finish the entire system, there, there's still vulner, vulnerabilities there. Our goal is eventually to get up to that 500-year level, um, similar to some of the other river cities. So the components of this, once we have a, a flood event, we need to store it and then pass it safely down through the system, get it, get it down through the city, out eventually under the Golden, Golden Gate. So um, to do that is a combination of storage and conveyance. Unfortunately, the levees were built a long time ago. Most of them were never really engineered. A lot of them were built for agriculture. Um, dredge the rivers and then just uh, they're basically sand and silt on the middle with um, clay cappings, a lot of them, and unfortunately the cities have built up behind them. Um, after uh, Katrina hit, there was a study done that looked at the past hundred levee failures across the country and 80% of them 
were due to seepage moving through or under the levees. They weren't due to overtopping. And that's scary in an urban area because if you know you're going to overtop, you can evacuate. But if it's failing and you can't see it, then, then and that's what happened uh, in a couple of spots in, in Katrina there. So because of that, the new design standards came on board, which mean we need to address that seepage. Um, the water moving under uh, can start moving material, creating voids that ultimately can lead to levee failure or other problems. So I, I put this in, the ideal is to have a visibility at the toe of the levee, so during a large flood event you can see if it, materials moving, you can see that they found some places where boils or water was coming up. They've sandbagged them so they can watch and, and, and see. Most of those are running clear. You see the one over on the, the left there looks a little murky, which means that it could be starting to move material, and that's when you start to worry about that. So um, this was just uh, two years ago. This was during the 2017. Uh, winter. This is just above us uh, on the Sacramento River. Um, it, it wasn't a high flood event as far as peak flows, but we had a lot of rain and water in the system for a long time, so the levees got pretty saturated. And they saw boils coming there, so they went in and did some emergency repairs. That same storm, this is in the pocket area just south of us here, those homes that's it hadn't rained for about two weeks here that's water moving through and under the levees the problem is and, and these homes are about two blocks off the river we can't see if it's moving material because of the homes are there so this is the scary part this is the, the what uh, we're trying to address here and we do that by going in and uh, putting seepage cutoff walls. They're about three or four foot wide walls that uh, we, we excavate the material out. We mix um, a mixture of a bentonite, which uh, is more, more impervious than, than regular soil, but also has some flexibility so it won't crack. And you, you mix it into a liquid, you put it back in, and then um, as it hardens, it, it Water takes a path of least resistance, so um, it, it hits that and, and won't go through and create the seepage path that can create the, the voids. <clears throat> so in addition to um, dealing with the seepage, we needed to reconstruct um, the levee slopes to stable slopes. Like I mentioned, a lot of it is not good material, especially you drive in the the Thomas area, we have some real tall levees that have very steep slopes. They're not, not stable. In, seven, in the 2017 event, we had levee failures on the land side all over the system. And in fact, here in Sacramento County, they had to evacuate Tyler Island because this, uh, this was a, a slope failure on the land side. Uh, just got too much water for the steep levee. We can't afford to have this happen here, like Natomas, for example. So we, we have to address that. And then the other thing we have to do is, is harden the, the banks and the levee slopes. So we're still a victim of the gold rush. Uh, back in the, the day, they were doing the hydraulic mining upstream, took down the sides of the mountains looking for gold. So for decades, that material has been moving down through the river system. When we originally built the levees, they put them close together to keep the, the velocities up to help keep the material from dropping out. We've since built dams, uh, Folsom, a Nimbus Dam, which has cut that flow material off. When rivers need to feed themselves, when especially in high flows, so the American River in a lot of places has uh, taken it down to bedrock, and now the only place to get material is sideways. So. Uh, we need to protect that from going to the, the levees. We didn't leave a lot of room. We put the levees close to the, the edge of the river channel. This is a good example. This is here in um, Sacramento. That's the Cap City Freeway down at the bottom there. Um, this was the 86 flood event. You can see how the levees were eroded. That was underwater. We didn't see that till that came down. We probably, if we'd seen that, they should have evacuated, but they didn't know it was that bad. I put the same spot over here, an aerial I found from 68. You can see there was a bench there with a, a, a lot of vegetation, a road down at the toe, 
um, that that's all gone and then on the other side you can see there was a, a row of trees that that's all gone too so it's that that um, erosion potential that we need to cut off and protect against so we've got um, four of these projects that are authorized are all dealing with um, returning the levy system to its original capacity and then beyond that in order to handle larger flow flood events we're increasing the capacity of the American River. Currently, it, it's designed to handle 115,000 cubic feet per second, and we're designing it to uh, handle 160,000, allow more water to pass through and handle larger storms. So that, that kicks in some additional work that, that needs to be done in some places. And then when we get down to the mouth of the river, the uh, capacity of the Sacramento River is the same north and south of where the American River comes in. So during large flood events, basically uh, the water coming down the American River, the equivalent goes out through the Sacramento Bypass over into the Yolo Bypass. So if we're going to increase the uh, capacity coming down the Sacramento River, then we also have to widen the Sacramento Bypass to take that additional flow over there. And then we also designed the Joint Federal Project, uh, the new auxiliary spillway and dam up at Folsom to handle releases of 160,000. So we're, we're designing the, the entire system to um, increase the conveyance capacity. And through that, we've got, that's all being addressed through five of the, the projects, that, uh, the six projects that we've got going. And then um, in addition to that, we're trying to get more storage. So by putting the new um, spillway in with the outlets lower in the, the reservoir, we're able to match the downstream capacity of the levee system early in the flood event. Right now, uh, you just can't get the water out and you basically have to wait till the reservoir fills to the top to open the, the spillway gates. So by putting in the new uh, dam and auxiliary spillway, we, we basically doubled the size of a storm we can handle with existing space. And then we're getting ready to start construction this year on raising Folsom Dam uh, three and a half feet. <clears throat> so uh, we've got uh, two of the, the projects uh, deal with the, the storage component on that. So after this group of projects are done, it'll get us up around the 300 year um, level of protection. Uh, we're, we're looking, we've, we've got uh, some plans in the making for what we need to do to get to the 500 year, but that this is a, a, a good increment to get us um, that additional protection that we need. And this, I just summarized, we've got right now $4.4 billion in projects that are currently federally authorized there. So just real quickly on the recently completed ones down at the bottom end, the Sacramento streams, uh, th that's a combination. We've got some large streams that can be real flashy and come up and out of banks, but also um, the Delta, um, you know, it used to be a big inland sea. The way the topography is such that in certain areas, if there's failures down in parts of the Delta, the water wants to come back up to, towards Sacramento. So it also serves as our southern a boundary, a barrier against uh, flooding from from uh, the Delta area there. Uh, we just finished that up in 2016 and, and uh, we're just doing some closeout work right now on it. Similarly, uh, that one was authorized just to put a time perspective on these in 1999. So it took about 17 or, um, can't do the math right, yeah, 17 years to, to get that done. <coughs> American River, both si the levees on both sides, we rebuilt for seepage and for um, to address the slope stability there. It was originally authorized in 96 with some additional authorizations in 99. We just finished that up and again are doing some cleanup work on that one. Actually benefited from that one being a little slow getting going. Uh, we had the new standards in place before we actually started the construction, so we didn't have to go back and, and, and do it again. And then uh, just last year, we finished up the work at uh, the new auxiliary dam and spillway. This is just some of the, the testing that, that we did um, earlier last year. So these are the ones that we finished up. So moving forward, the Folsom Dam raise, um, there's actually 
four dams and eight dikes that, that uh, make up Folsom Dam. It's not in a very good spot for a dam, usually like a narrow canyon, but it's downstream of the confluence of the North and South Fork of the American Rivers. And so uh, the, the only difference, the dams are on old river channels and the dikes are just low spots in the topography. They're both basically similar designs, just, just um, different, they call them differently. We have to raise all those structures three and a half feet. And then the gates on the existing dam don't go all the way to the top, so we have to modify those so that they can stay closed longer um, during flood events moving forward. Also, um, we're working on uh, the Natomas project, rebuilding the levees around there. There's 42 miles of levees. In 2007, after the Corps looked at the new standards, they uh, they had earlier decided Natomas had a 100-year level of protection in 1998. In 2007, they came out and said it had less than a 30-year level of protection. So uh, we went ahead, SAFCA did, um, went ahead and moved forward, rebuilding part of the levees while we were getting the um, through the, the federal um, process to get congressional authorization. And we um, build about um, 18 of the 42 miles of levees. Uh, Congress authorized it in 2014, and the Corps is moving forward with uh, construction on several of the reaches right now. Uh, this is just some of the, the pictures from the original construction we did on the, in, um, we had a, a bit of a challenge in Natomas because you have um, homes and businesses on the water side of the levees that you have to keep um, being able to have to they have to be able to assess, access their their property and you have to keep them functional so in the north area where we didn't have um, many homes we built adjacent a new levee next to the existing one so that because the garden highways on top of the old old levee and we there's no way we could keep those folks whole um, while we were building um, the, the new one, if we had to rebuild the old one. And also, that vegetation on, along the levee uh, serves as habitat, so um, it was just easier to build new levee adjacent to it and a better levee that's fully engineered there. I wish we could do that everywhere in the city, but we did have that opportunity up there. And then finally, um, we did have the American River Common Features uh, Ward of 2016 work, basically that looked at everything that had been done and, and what else was left in the system that needed to be addressed. This was actually our largest authorization yet. There is a typo on there. It was authorized in December 2016 instead of 19 um, there. But it, it um, the levees on both sides of the American River were taken care of and the Thomas projects taking care of the levees around the Thomas. So we still needed to do the pocket area and then the levees up in the north area along Arcade Creek. And then also this is the, the authorization where we're addressing the erosion potential. And then it's also the authorization where we're widening the Sacramento Weir and bypass. So last year, last February, Congress passed the Supplemental Appropriations uh, Emergency Bill f uh, as a result of the three hurricanes that had um, devastated much of the nation. Uh, they put about $16 billion worth in the bill with uh, over $10 billion of it to go to the states and uh, Puerto Rico that had been hit by the, the three hurricanes. They also put about $5 billion in uh, for states that had had a flood emergency declared over the last few years to get ahead of the next one, try to, try to rebuild the system so that we don't have, we're not in this continual reaction mode, but try to get ahead of that next one. So on July 5th, um, we, we worked real hard with the administration. They uh, provided uh, $1.8 billion towards our projects. Uh, they fully funded almost $1.6 billion for the American River Common Features work. They gave us the money for the entire project. And then they gave us what was needed to finish the, the Folsom Dam raise. Um, and so that means both of those are fully funded to completion now. The Thomas was already um, in the funding annual funding stream, and it was already getting the most funding for any flood project anyway annually so so this was a real big benefit for us uh, 
Last year it was ironic in that they were slow passing the fiscal year 18 budget, so it got passed in calendar year 2018. We had that supplemental emergency, and then they they passed the Corps of Engineers a budget in on time last year. So we actually had um, two fiscal year bud appropriation bills and that supplemental in one calendar year. So we had about 1.9 billion in federal funding. And uh, the governor added um, about 170 million in his May revise that then passed for state cost share for urban area core projects, which is primarily ours. So we ended up with a little over $2 billion in calendar year 2018. The reason I wanted to mention that, um, the goal is to have them completed in five years by 2024. Since the 1986 flood event, we put about $2 billion in the system. So in 32 years, we got about $2 billion. And so in one year, we, we got about the same amount um, with the idea of getting it in place in five years. So it's an opportunity to get ahead of that next big, big flood event that's out there. And this just kind of showed where we were. Uh, the annual appropriations, we've been running between 80 and 100 million. And then we had the, the big year last, uh, that last year. And then in the 19, we only have to ask for Natomas now. So it, it makes it a lot, lot easier moving forward. So I, I wanted to show graphically uh, kind of how this really was important last year. This was where we stood at December of the end of 2017. The green are the areas that have basically been completed and the yellow is what still needed to go. And then this is what happened at the end of 18. So the red are areas where we've got under construction or, or they're about ready to award. And the blue are all the areas that are fully funded. So it was a significant uh, year last year um, as far as that goes. So our challenge is moving forward. We, we are finding, um, uh, you know, we've, we've got to get the designs done. We've got a, a, a certain amount that a safe ahead already done designs ahead of, of waiting for the, the funding. So the Corps is going to be able to award some contracts in 2019 for both the levy work and up at the dam raise. And then um, the goal is to get everything done by 2024. I think we'll see a, a nominal amount in 19, a larger amount in 20, but really 21, 22, and 23, and then somewhat into 24, we're going to see hundreds of millions of dollars worth of construction a year. And we are starting to hit some constraints with some of the consulting firms as far as having the capability to get the designs done as quickly. And so we're having to reach out uh, to find um, more capacity there. The construction firms are what I'm really worried about. Um, the the last two bids that we've had only had one one bidder on on both of those and and so um, you know, with all this work gas taxes create a lot of work also and so I, I I'm just worried and there's a certain type of equipment that's needed for the slurry wall work um, so we've got a reach out we're, we're actually reaching out to some of the, the the construction firms and finding out you know capability oops <laughs> capacity and, and everything like that because uh we're talking four or five hundred million a year for for some of those years so that that will be a bit of a challenge there anyway so with that um see if you have any questions yeah thanks rick that's you know i'm always amazed about the size and the complexity of this whole program it's it's amazing what you guys are accomplishing here and i think you should be noting that you're doing this all while in compliance with environmental quality rules and regulations and meeting all the obligations for protecting endangered species and you have some real cutting edge habitat restoration programs going on up there too so i think that's important to note also are there any questions from the commissioners? Question. Laura. Um, I just wanted to, are you saying that maybe there's not enough workers to actually do all these jobs and not, you know? Well, I, we're a little worried whether there's only a certain amount of, um, th there's only been a certain amount of the equipment that can reach down. When we're talking these slurry walls, uh, there's two types of equipment. There's a long stick that 
can get down about 70 to 80 feet. And then there's um, a deep soil mixer that can go down about 120 feet. Well, there's only a, f a certain number of that type of equipment that's out on the West Coast right now. And so, um, you know, I'm not sure if, if we're gonna have that be an issue um, in those out years. When we first were trying to get Natomas, there's three contracts that uh, the core let, or they advertised a couple of years ago. They've been trying to get them awarded. There were protests, three or four protests, and finally um, the core gave up and they went to a different um, method where they pre-qualified and broke them into smaller groups and it ended up that uh, they all ended up going under small business so none of the firms that bid originally act and did the protest actually got any of the work so i don't know if there was a um feeling of it's not worth going after there anyway we need to explore that a little bit to to find out um what the issues might be and what we we might be able to do Okay, I see. All right, thank you. Marjorie, you have a question? I do have a question. Thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. It's always, um, I have a vested interest because I live in the pocket area, mm -hmm. and I would really hope that you would concentrate on that area first, but mm -hmm. that's my own <laughs> opinion. Um, you know, when you were talking about the slurry walls and the contractors, there are very few, but when the Corps put out their original bids, the requirements for the slurry wall contractors were very narrow, and there was only one in Sacramento. And I know that you know there were some firms that had requested a little bit broader um, range for the the equipment. Have you looked at maybe broadening your horizons on the type of contractors that can do slurry walls? So I think. What happened, the very first contract they were putting out was going to require closing Garden Highway for about six months. So they, they wanted to make sure it was somebody with experience that they wouldn't get in there and end up closing it. I mean, because if you don't get done in one season, then you're, you're going over to a whole new construction season. They were trying to avoid a major problem on a major highway there. Um, they since went to a process where they pre-qualified contractors. Um, that were uh, could meet the slurry wall qualifications. Uh, 16 apply put in for it. 13 were awarded. So there's 13 qualified contractors on the list, and the other three were given what they could do to get qualified. So there's a group of 13 that we thought were going to be bidding on these last two, and only one did on each of them. So. Um, you, there were 13 that were qualified from slurry wall work. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Mark, would you have a question? I, I do. I also have a vested interest. I live on the American River. Um, <laughs> nice place to live, too. You guys have done a wonderful job out there. That first thing is just a comment to all of us how truly fortunate we are to have an organization like yours with the organizational capability to get the local interest involved and still be able to tap into the federal money and tap into the state money to get us safer. Because I truly believe, having lived through a couple of these events, that we're a lot safer now than we were when I was looking down the levee and I was seeing two feet of freeboard to the top. Um, second thing, I just, I noticed in uh, one thing a little bit concerned me. On one of your slides, it was actually on page uh, 11, you talked about water coming up in the pocket area, seepage. How do, how do people see, did, does that come up through the storm drains or just show up on the dry it, streets? It's, some's coming up through storm, storm drains. A lot of it's just coming up through the yards. Really? You go in people's backyards and they're full of water and, and uh, it's, it's just coming up all over the place. You can see on, on this one where the steps are, the water's running off the, the lawn uh, right there. Yeah. That's just seeping up through the lawn. So uh, even in my location, I'm probably a half mile off the river, I could see something like this in my yard. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's scary because the, you know the, there's not a lot of room in the pocket area to work on the levees. And um, they're, they're basically sand and silt filled in the middle. So, um, so yeah, we've got to get them um, as, as 
best addressed as we can given the tight working area that we have there. Yeah, well, thank you anyway for your service. We appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Uh, Tony, go ahead. Well, thanks for the excellent presentation. Actually, just to follow up on the pocket area, so that, that's where a lot of landowners own land all the way to the river. And so is that, um, we call encroachment on the levee an issue down there? There, there, there are a lot of encroachments on the levees that um, we will be working with the landowners over the next year or two to get out of the way of construction so that the core can come in and rebuild those levees and then um, they'll have to, on the ones that are acceptable, they'll, um, we'll, we'll work with them to get them made whole financially and then they would have to go back to the Central Valley Flood Protection Board to be able to, to put them back again. Gotcha. And then regarding uh, Folsom, so is is the new spillway fully operational yet? Yes. Or it is okay. Mm -hmm. So it could yeah, be there's still there's still a few um, punchless items, but it's been turned over to the Bureau of Reclamation. It's it's fully functional right now. So and, and so will the storage, your criteria, whatever for winter storage in Folsom increase then because of the ability to release more? Um, so basically, what 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 it'll do is. Right now, um, the way we've been operating, we create additional space based on, there's three large reservoirs upstream, uh, French Meadows, Union Valley, Hellhole, that have about 250, 300,000 acre foot of storage when they're empty. They take about eight to 12% of a storm peak off of a large flood event. So if those, but they're hydropower reservoirs, so um, they're not operated for flood. If they happen to be empty, then we are able to hold Folsom a little fuller. If they happen to be full, then we have to drop Folsom down more. So if they're empty, we hold Folsom at about 40% uh, empty. If they're full, we drop it down to 67% empty. So we have to do that at the start of the flood season before we built this new spillway because we couldn't get the water out. So with the new spillway, we have the capability of getting the water out in a few days. So uh, part of what we also did was a forecast-based operation, um, and it's based on the conditions on the ground. So basically, we're not going to, um, we'll always hold it during the winter at 40% empty, but we're not gonna go down deeper than that until the conditions are, are needed. And so uh, what that does is it really benefits the other purposes of the reservoir. Because a, a good example was the 97 um, flood event. The November of 96 was one of the driest Novembers on record. December we had a large snowpack build up and the storm came in on New Year's Day brought a lot of it down. Um, we almost flooded, but it filled all the upstream reservoirs. So um, we had to draw Folsom down to about 67% empty, no more snow the rest of the year. And we just melted most of the snowpack. So we had flooding and water issues in the same year. So with we won't need to do that now because um, with the new spillway and the forecast-based operations, We'll look, you know, five week out, five days out, and if something big's coming, then we can start drawing it down. Otherwise, we, we keep it where it's at there. So, thank you. Go ahead, Mark. Is there a, like a long range plan that you follow and coordinating with other regions? Um, well, I mean, we work with other regions, but uh, with the state, but not on. Our, our project. So right now, um, you know, Safeco, we're, we're um, just focused on, on Sacramento. We, our, our funding all comes from the property owners here. So, so everything we're doing is to try to, to increase the property owners here. Having said that, we work very closely with the other agencies around, and we've been working a lot with uh, the folks in Yolo and Solano County uh, trying to reach consensus on how we might be able to move forward in widening the Yolo Bypass and Fremont Weir so as not to impact them, to address some of their issues while also um, trying to get a little more flood control for us. So 
from a regional standpoint, when it comes to implementing the projects we do, but um, uh, I, I do, I am on the, I do, we are members of the National Waterways Conference, which is a, a group of, of uh, core agencies across the country. So I, I do meet with them somewhat, but not, not on specific projects there. So I don't know if that answered your question or not. Yeah, I was just wondering if like, you know, specific work is done on one side of the river levees, if it's matches on the other side. So we work closely. West Sacramento has uh, their own, they have a West Safeca over there. They have a project that was just authorized in December of 2016. And in fact, they're doing some early work on a setback down um, on, on the Sacramento down at the, the lower end, Southport area there. Um, yeah, so we, we the, when the core did the study, we have to look at hydraulic impacts. So we can't do anything to our levees that are going to make it worse for anybody else. So if, if we do, then we've got to address it somehow. So, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, Buzz, go ahead. Yeah, Rick, thank you. Uh, this has been a great get an update here. And just to show how long it's been since I've been in attached to this, I got a couple of questions sure. about uh, the status of some, of some other projects. Um, in particular, you mentioned that the, the, the new auxiliary spillway is operational <laughs> other than some, excuse me, some uh, uh, punch items that, that you're going to deal with. Is it um, now fully operational? That is to say that there is a flood diagram and uh, you know the, the rules for using that spillway so in the, place? The new water control manual will, is actually, um, it's gotten all the approvals. We're gonna sign it uh, in February. Oh, great. But the core gave an exception to the diagram for this year, so we're operating, except to the old diagram, so we're operating with the new diagram, even though it's not, just not a, a temporary um, approval while we get the final approval. So, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, that's terrific. With respect to the dam raise and other work, can you give me a, give us a status on where the environmental work is on that, the, the um, EIS on that and the bio, the biological opinions. Yeah. So on the dam raise, those have already been done. Um, but they they had to be done before it was authorized. And then, uh, so the original the original EIS was done in two thousand two, with the the study along with the biological opinions back then. Um, it was authorized in two thousand four. They were going to go construction as soon as we were done with the Folsom Dam modifications, which at the time were going to be enlarging the existing outlets. Right. Those didn't work out, and so we had to go back and, and re, um, reconfigure to the new auxiliary spillway. And so uh, when they did that, they also changed what they were going to look at in the dam raise. And so there was, uh, in 2007, uh, 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 second environmental statement was done and then um, there was also a supplemental that I th was done last year on that so we, we might hit some areas I, I think where we're probably most likely going to have to do some additional supplementals is because we're moving up the time frame on these things probably the air quality is going to we're going to have to look at that again and um, the traffic and stuff some of those things we're going to have to address but the most of the environmental work's already been done on those terrific and then what about the temperature control structure is that uh, you know, yeah. still going on, or is that just uh... no? It, it it is now. Um, the uh, the this emergency supplemental was for the flood control features only. There's a number of projects that were funded under it that all have ecosystem components to them, and the core is working with Congress now. They'd like to get a bill to let them do those also so they can get all these projects off the book and, and completed. Um, so we'll see if we, we might have an opportunity to get some funding there. The, the problem we've had is we really can't get in to do the temperature shutters till we get the other work done because uh, just not enough room up there on top of the dam. So what this does though by 
being able to move it up, then we should be able to get those temperature shutters in quicker. And in fact, uh, what we're looking at now is we're going to take two of the gates out at a time up on, on top of the dam. If we can get uh, the funding in time, uh, we'll, we're looking to see if it makes sense to add the temperature shutter to the contract that is for the contractor doing the gates or if it's specialized enough different work to do it separate but we, we may may see if we can combine it with that last gate contract and and just one last question um i mean you you've got appropriations for a number of these things i mean where to actually is an authorization right. and then you got to come mm -hmm. back and get actually get some money right put with that so of the projects that you have in place now do you have appropriations or funding for all of them or are they you're still looking for appropriations to get through so the, what you've actually got planned yeah. for the moment so the six projects we we've got authorized three are completed as far as funding goes we're just doing close out two of them with this uh, funding is are fully appropriated so the only one we're still needing annual appropriations on is is natomas and we're about we're a little over half done there so we're probably talking about um well we got 4.4 .4 billion in authorized projects we've got about 2 billion in the ground and we just got 1.8 billion so we're probably another five six hundred million that we're going to need over the next five years and that's in right about the range of what we've been getting annually so that should be we're not competing with ourselves anymore right. so um, it, to be honest with you what's probably going to hold us up as much as anything is uh, the resources to, to just get it all done. Okay. Well, thank you, Rick. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions from the commission? Um, I guess you've worn us out, Rick. Thank you very much. Uh, you. We really appreciate you coming in and talking to us again. Oh, sure. Thanks. Let me. Um, our next agenda item is to uh, um, uh, approve our November 2008 meeting minutes. Uh, I, I assume you've all had a chance to look at it and provide comments. Mark, I think you already provided comments to Jim. I had a couple things that I thought we might look at. Um, is it things that we need to discuss or is it things you can just pass I on to Jill? I think edits that we need. I've talked to Jill about them. I can just tell you quickly what they are. I, I can just give them to Jill. I'll just give them to Jill then if that's well, okay. She would have found them earlier if I'd just given her. Will do. Okay. Uh, is there any uh, further changes necessary for the meeting minutes or are they available for uh, adoption? If there's a motion, please. I move that we approve them with the edits that Jill has. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second it. Oh. Uh, seconded by Eric. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? I abstain. I abstain. Two abstentions from the end of the table. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. We've adopted and accepted those. Um, next item is our Environmental Management Director's Report. Uh, Marie, can you go speak to this? Sure. So what I will do is augment um, to the previous presentation on the the campfire in Butte County. Um, we EMD has sent nine total staff so far up there and possibly two more we will know pretty shortly if they need them so that'd be a total of 11. so we began this um, response um, basically to calaveras county which i believe was the butte fire um, a couple years back and we realized that you know sacramento county we're a big jurisdiction metropolitan, but we're surrounded by a lot of smaller rural counties, and we realized we really need to train up our staff because of these disasters that just seem to be continuing. Um, so we've invested time. We looked at um, San Diego County and looked at their model. They are two-thirds larger than our county, but they have faced so many different disasters within their jurisdiction, wildfires, flooding, mudslides, um, power outages. So they had really done a lot of work in the area of disaster response training their staff and they assisted us, our department. And we've been working on this 
I would say for like the last four four years, because it takes time to train your staff. Um, we do we have realized we need committed staff. So recently we asked for volunteers to form a dedicated team. Before it was small enough, you know, we could send people here and there, but we decided no, this is getting to be pretty major disaster. This campfire he showed you the base camp, that was a rude awakening to our staff. This is the first time they had to go to a tent. And we've warned them we don't know, each disaster is different. Every circumstance is different. And it was like, wow, I get to, you know, I mean, it made him realize, yes, I have a little hardship, but look at the community, what they lost. So uh, we've been investing in our staff, and um, Doug Osborne, who presented, has gone to almost every disaster um, so far. We didn't get called to the car fire in Reading. They used their public health staff. But um, we're continuing on this, and as he said, we do have a hot wash after each one, and we talk about things that we could do better. And each one, they think of something else that just a little tweak or something to prepare for, maybe another tool that we need to throw in their go bag because they're just off. And these poor rural counties, they just don't have the resources or the staff, you know, to even deal with it. I mean, when I spoke to uh, Tom Parker, he's just a supervisor, and I asked him, Tom, what's going on? Do you need help? This is a phone call. He said, my director is gone. All the managers are, you know, he goes, they're out. They all lost their homes. I'm the last one standing with three staff. And the poor supervisor's trying to manage all this. You know, so these small rural counties, yeah, they have it tough. So, um, but just so you know, the environmental health departments are networking. They're working on this whole, does that CCDH was the California Conference of Environmental Health Directors. They realize that need and they're getting the resources to these small rural counties, you know, forms, um, trying to get them the resources. And whenever something happens, we call them immediately, our counterparts, and ask them, what do you need? And we usually just do a, a major phone call just to try to, walk them through this disaster that they're facing. But anyway, do you have any questions? A comment, maybe, and a question. My um, comment earlier about making better use of our electronic tools, which are not ours, but belong to other people, mm -hmm. turns out. One thing that struck me in that whole discussion is Sonoma County had their tools. Well, yeah, Sonoma County's got, what, a couple hundred thousand people, well, probably a couple, two and a half million people or something, and a lot of money. Not, not the same with, uh, with well, Paradise Area. One thing that um, DTSC, Department, State Department of Toxics and EPA, they are sharing data. They didn't know because they're on the ground. Um, I didn't want to interrupt. But what they were doing real time, DTSC had a map. And you could see the owners can see the parcels. And they can see which parcels are being worked on because... You know, they want to visit their property. What's, what's this debris cleanup plan that the state has? What does this all mean? So they were explaining to them at the community meetings. I know my staff weren't there. They were out there working. But um, they did have real-time maps, and we could see them online. So they have improved on their tools. They are improving on sharing of data. Um, but, yes, Paradise was a small Rural, very rural county, very poor, more, more, say very poor, but just a different community, retired people, older people. Um, I'm not saying Sonoma did not have retired people, but it was just a whole different community. Well, one other comment, and that is that Sacramento County sits up here as a big resource for all the folks around us, north of us mm -hmm. and east of us. But we have nothing like the resources that L.A. County has, or San Diego County, or Riverside, or San Bernardino. So I think what we've done in this particular fire in Paradise is exemplary, that we responded with the tools we had. You had some folks who had a lot of experience, and they were out there doing things that would have been overlooked had they not been there. And I think we should be giving EMD a big old pat on the back, because what? you guys prepared for this. And you're not preparing if we have another one, because um, it's when, not if. You heard Jan. He's pretty detailed. But Jan, when he was at, he, he responded to Sonoma, um, the Tubbs fire. 
And the one thing he realized that they didn't catch because they were all just, you know, overwhelmed by debris, fire, was the swimming pools. Just sitting there with water. And he goes, well, no one's looking at them. Are you sharing this information with Vector because of the mosquito issue that's going to rise? No one thought of it. He thought of it, right? Mr. Scientific. Um, and he shared that information. They were GISing where these pools were. So the vector uh, special district could come out and deal with these swimming pools with standing water, which were going to be a mosquito breeding problem, you know, once the spring hit. So anyway, so yeah, sometimes our staff, other staff, you know, the Bay Area, they do respond and they pick up things also. So each time, you know, they're, they're gaining more experience, but it's, it's challenging. You know, they come back changed, but they're very proud of helping and uh, anyway. Mm -hmm. Marie, I have another real quick question. I couldn't tell how much they were coming in contact with the residents that, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so I was wondering if they had training in, you know, because I'm thinking of two things, um, you know, grieving residents as well as potential looters. Mm -hmm. So if they've had any training in crisis management, you know, dealing with people like that. They are... Um they're doing probably helping with re-entry so giving the people the forms you know you showed that uh that whatever that building at the beginning so they were at first stuffing uh information for the residences at the checkpoints so when the residents would come they would give them a bag of information you know before they would go out and see their property and then also um helping them with the re-entry forms, the whole process of do you want to get on the statewide or the state uh, debris removal plan or do you want to use your own insurance to deal with it yourself? So they are being apprised. They're very, you know, there's, there's a lot of people there at the stations for the people. Public health is there regarding uh, mental health, that type. So that's public health response in that arena so they are there yeah they would just say, yeah, arena, yeah so public health is the one that's up there you know with mm -hmm. uh mental health or you Social know so, right kind of right so public health up there i know they were they were there in sacramento county public health dr casiri's group went up there also i just had a quick question so mm -hmm. it sounds like the bulk of the work has been done, but they're still down there, they said through February, right? What are they focusing on at this point? What is their primary objective? They're just doing the phase one part part of it, removing the household hazardous waste. Yeah. Um, in these rural communities, the experience that they see is some people, you know, it's rural, right? So they have more things stored on their property, kerosene, propane tanks, uh, you know, maybe they're doing some automotive maintenance. You saw the person with all the cars, the vehicles, right? Right. Um, so they're removing all those materials off of the property and identifying if asbestos is there. So then once they remove that, then they're going to deal with more of the ash. Okay, that's the next. Yeah, because they've got to get the property clean. Um, um, if they ever do another presentation, I'll have them show you like a before-after shot. I don't know if our staff were, will be there, but in Calaveras they were. So they could sh they, you could see the before and then the after. It's just totally clean. The property is clean to rebuild on. Okay. That's All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. that your yep, that concludes everything. Okay, thank you. Um, just moving forward to see if we can wrap this meeting up. Uh, into commissioner comments, I have a couple things I'd like to raise since this is the first meeting of the 2019 year. We can kick it off um, and maintain momentum from the work we were doing in 2018. And as you recall, we had a series of initiatives uh, we were undertaking. What I would like to have is that the each of the committee leads uh, who are implementing these initiatives be prepared for our next meeting to give us a summary of your actions that you've completed in 2018 and what you propose to complete in 2019. And if you could summarize that in a paragraph and provide that to Jill before our next meeting, um, uh, we'd appreciate that so that we can discuss it as a group uh, and make a plan for next year. Um, secondly, um, I would like to um, 
mention that uh, I looked back at our, our attendance at the commission meetings, and I'd like to report that we've, for the past two years, we've maintained uh, an average of 83% attendance uh, uh, over the course of the year, which uh, was well and above what we did in 2016. So I think you should be complimented for uh, being able to maintain. But I would like to see if we can achieve a, a, a greater level of attendance. So because we only meet one day a month, I would really appreciate it if you could plan your schedules so that you can fully attend the meetings that we have to the degree you can. Now, obviously, we know you have other jobs and other commitments in life. Uh, but because this, this is not really an over, overly demanding schedule here, I think we'd like to see if we can get it up to 90% for the, for the course of 2019. Um, uh, also, the, um, we prepared the draft annual report and we submitted it to everybody for comments. And have we completed that review period? It's now complete. Okay. And did we receive additional comments from the commissioners? Um, I did receive a few. They've been yeah, put in the report. Okay. Okay, so the report, I appreciate the folks taking a look at the annual report, and as Jill just reported, she's going to be releasing it. So uh, it's going to our sponsoring authorities, and uh, thank you very much for making that effort successful. Uh, one of the, the final thing I'm going to mention is I, I'd like to pursue another initiative, which is kind of just something I thought of the other day, uh, but it involves the use of GIS information. And I think I wanted to pose this to the commissioners to see if there's any capability on the commission staff who can do GIS uh, to create a map of resources for Sacramento County. And so if you guys can think about your own capabilities or maybe access to capabilities, if we could get a, a GIS uh, capability to create a resources map, I'd like to talk about this at our next meeting also. Any questions on that, Mark? No question on that. Okay. Okay. Um, that that finishes my comments. If you have a comment, go ahead. Uh, my comment is as much a comment as it is a request. I think you all know that I had some experience with my wife and Alzheimer's. I've now put a lot of effort into the Alzheimer's Association. They're putting a lot of effort this year into integrating concerns about Alzheimer's as a public health question, like smoking for example, this public health question. Right now, it's just a data question. It's just hanging out there. It, would it be possible maybe for me to invite somebody from the association to come tell us about what they mean by that and what they hope to accomplish at one of our meetings? Why don't we raise it with uh, folks and see, because we have available topics available in the course of the next year, and we'll, we can discuss that to see if there's an opportunity it, to bring it, them in. Okay, it would be most convenient, and uh, not convenient, but they're, they've got a piece of legislation, so doing it maybe at the next uh, televised meeting might be the most beneficial for the effort. Let's talk about it. Yeah, good, thanks. Any other comments from the commission? I have a, a question. Sure. What is GIS? Oh, excuse me, it's a geographic information system. It's a computerized mapping system. Uh, and you can present data, uh, very defined, because uh, it uses computer uh, data for... for and It's possible, but I would like to produce a map of resources in Sacramento County using GIS to, uh, for the detail and the quality it could produce. I'm just wondering how, how you would think people are going to access it, like through their phone? Well, actually, I'm thinking of a, uh, a large poster board physical map that we could produce. Oh, OK. That's what I'm thinking. And you could probably make it electronic also. Yeah. Uh, Richard, what, uh, what type of resources did you have in mind? Um, well, I was, my first thought was for uh, uh, lands of, of, of Sacramento County, lands that are in uh, parks or uh, dedicated open space, preserves, refuges, or being managed for some environmental purpose that will not uh, enable future development. And I think that if we can get those basic categories, it would be very informative to the public. Okay. Uh, regarding the an the um, the annual report, uh, will it be sent then to each city council member, or just to the mayor? What's I'll send it to to um, the mayor of the cities um, and our the supervisor that was just elected chair. That's Kennedy. Oh, so it doesn't go. Okay, so if I want my own personal city council member to 
know about it, I should forward it to him. Yes, so, please. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Um, I just want to remind everybody. So next televised meeting is our awards meeting as well, right? That's, yes. So I did send out a kind of a, I'm keeping a track, tracking information sheet with potential contacts for everybody to sign up for. Um, I know Laura has already signed up for quite a few of them, but there's plenty of other good opportunities for other folks to reach out to people and just get our names in front of them so we can start getting those applications in as soon as possible. Why don't you keep reminding us weekly okay. until then? All right, will do. <laughs> I would just like to say real quick, the people I've contacted have been very excited. Now, whether or not they turn anything in, but they're they're very excited to hear about who we are and about applying or think or finding people that are organizations that they can, their troops, Girl Scout troops, Boy Scout groups, those kind of things. Okay. Uh, any additional comments or questions? With that, uh, the meeting is adjourned till February 25th. Thank you very much.